respond to it. So I'm seeing Patrick Rivera here, Brad Conroy. Um, I'm such a newbie at this. But uh, go ahead and uh, if you guys got any question, uh, <laughs> Bitcoin cash ordeal. Oh, yeah. It's been crazy. You guys fire away any questions you want in the comment section. I'll just read off the question and uh, see what I can do to answer whatever you got. You can talk uh, stock market or whatever. Oh, thanks, Patrick. Yep. That was fun to do that. I really like um, talking with Grant and uh, all those guys over at Real Vision. We're good friends. Uh, they're great guys. A lot of fun. Uh, so... What do I think about the Bitcoin cash ordeal? So, man, I could probably talk about this one for a while. Um, I I mean, you guys have heard on the podcast, I'm a fan of, of cryptocurrencies. I just think they're a very, very difficult... Um, it's a difficult sector to, to really wrap your head around. Um, recently, with the Bitcoin cash stuff versus the... Bitcoin, um, just to kind of put my opinion out there, which one I particularly think has a better chance of withstanding the test of time, I would definitely say that the standard Bitcoin is better than Bitcoin Cash, and most of my reasoning really revolves around the idea that uh, the centralization piece of it. So the thing I, I guess the narrative I like to say to people is what is what is it that cryptocurrencies are trying to solve? And uh, when you answer that simple question, they're really trying to solve the central banking manipulation that's happened, I would argue, since the 1940s. Um, you know, there's others that got opinions on some of that stuff, but for me, I think that it's been happening for quite a long time, from the 40s to 1971 when we came off the gold standard you had. Um, quite a bit of central banking manipulation through adjustment of the, of the, uh, the money multiplier, which then created a lot of, of growth through credit expansion here in the U.S. And um, after we came off the gold standard, what happened then is the, the fiat wasn't pegged to anything, and so what you have is all these foreign governments printing, not, not immediately, but uh, within the decade, you had you know, Japan, over in Europe, you got now China's the one that's been hot and heavy in the last decade or two. Um, basically printing a lot of fiat locally and what that does is it creates a, an incentive for all the money to get pushed out of the U.S. And Long story short, because I could go on and just ramble here, but um, with Bitcoin, you're having a protocol that's completely decentralized because you don't have a governing body making decisions on forks and things like that. It's 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 the uh, it's the group of people that have to come to a consensus as to what the protocol is going to continue to look like moving forward. Whereas Bitcoin Cash, you have a few people that are really kind of dictating what is and what isn't happening. And I think that that defeats the whole purpose of, of what you set out to originally do with cryptocurrencies, which is to provide a fixed monetary baseline, immutable currency that can't be manipulated by a central authority. So um, one of the questions there, wow, we're getting a lot of questions. Um, one of the questions there is, you know, how do I feel about Bitcoin cash ordeal that's recently happening where um, Roger Ver and a few others are basically pumping the uh, pumping the coin, the Bitcoin cash coin um, by selling off all their Bitcoins and then swapping it into Bitcoin cash. You know, for me, I'm just kind of looking at it as a lot of noise. I think the, the safe way to play a lot of this stuff is don't don't try to think you're too smart. <laughs> Um, I think kind of owning a portfolio of uh, cryptocurrencies that are broken down by market cap and by also volume of trade, I would kind of weight them 50%, 50%. Um, is probably the best approach. And, uh, you know, based on that weighting, you should own, you know, like Bitcoin, I think this makes up 50% of the total market cap of all the crypto coins. 
And I would really only, for me personally, I'm only focusing on like the top five. Something else that I find really important with this is mind versus uh, things that are pre-mind versus non-pre-mind. If something is pre-mind, I think that that's a red flag for, for anyone. They should be concerned about that. Um, the, uh, the, uh, my wife just stood in front of me and held up a, a question. <laughs> um, the, the difference between the mind and the pre-mind is if a person is doing a, a uh, pre-mind coin, they can adjust the supply of the coins that are outstanding and that can manipulate the price. And so I'm really, really against anything that's pre-mined. And I think anybody who doesn't necessarily understand that conversation or what I'm necessarily talking about, I would do a little bit of homework and a little bit of research. Something else that I want to address real fast while I'm talking on this subject is a lot of people are sharing articles on Twitter and other locations where they're saying, you know, look at Dubai, they're getting ready to launch their own cryptocurrency and how is that going to impact Bitcoin and some other things. And um, this is, for me, that's this just a non-issue. It's not even something that's worth worrying about. And the reason why is because it goes back to my original comment about centralization versus non-central, non-centralized uh, cryptocurrency in that, let's think about it. If, if I'm the Dubai government and I want to release my own crypto coin, I'm controlling the protocol, meaning I can make updates to the monetary baseline anytime I want. So if that's the case, you know, what good is it if I, if I start a war or anything like that and I need to create more monetary baseline out of the crypto coin? I have complete control over that if I'm the government. So... Um, that's a concern. So in all these coins are going to be pre-mined. They'd be crazy not to have them pre-mined. Um, and what I think is going to happen is a lot of people are going to get wrapped up into the brand of cryptocurrency. And they don't necessarily understand how they even work. And they're going to make some fundamental mistakes. And, and they're going to place their trust in areas that I think might be a little uh, uh, not warranted or probably uh, not... Ill-placed, I guess, is probably the best way I can explain it. So, wow, we got a lot of questions uh, coming in here. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but uh, the whole Bitcoin cash thing that's happening over the weekend versus Bitcoin, I think that you just got to kind of sit still and keep a close eye on it. And I think that there's a lot of people that are fighting to, to take the power away from the original blockchain and um, I'm not too concerned about Bitcoin Cash. I'm much more of a hardcore Bitcoin person because it's solving the fundamental problem of uh, getting something that's pegged on a global level and um, decentralization. All right. Uh, here we go. BG, what's your opinion about market status? Is it overvalued? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean... We've been saying that on the show for quite a while. I, you know, the thing about the market is you have no idea how long the, the craziness can last. I think a lot of the reasons we're seeing the market so high right now is just because interest rates are so low. And so that spread between what you're seeing on the fixed income side and on the equity side, you're still getting a, a better return out of equities than on the fixed income side, especially when you account for inflation. And... Uh, that's why you're seeing it continue to get pumped. You know, I mean, it's it's hanging on there. Last week was a little bumpy, but for the most part, I mean, this thing's still holding really strong. Um, one of the things that I'm watching pretty closely is what the ECB and uh, what's happening over in Japan. As long as they kind of have the spigot turned on still, which they do, they're still doing QE like crazy. I think that that's su supplying... Uh, global credit a lot more than people are giving it credit for. So we'll see how much longer that can last, and we'll see if we're seeing a change in, in any of those dynamics. I don't expect the Fed, to, the U.S. Fed, to be doing anything too dramatic. So as long as Europe and Japan are still easing like crazy, um, I don't see this thing doing anything too drastic right now. Um, it might, you know, struggle around a little bit, but for the most part, I. I see things just kind of holding steady, 
maybe even going up more. But um, I think that there's extreme risk for people that are buying right now uh, because at best, I think if you're buying an index or an ETF, you're getting a 3% return at best. So um, good luck with that. Um, Thomas, you said, what's my favorite sports team? You know, I'm, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, so uh, Steelers. <laughs> All right, here's the next question here. For a single debt-free 30-year-old guy who rents the accommodation or rather invest his leftover monthly income in the market, how much of a cash emergency fund do you recommend I save? There's people out there. I think it really depends on how secure you feel in your job, right? You know? I mean, there's no way that you can necessarily control a lot of those things, but um, if you're a person who spends a lot of your paycheck each month, then that's going to mean that you need to sock away a little bit more than the guy who lives pretty frugally. So that, I would argue that that probably depends on the individual person, but I would always pre prepare for the worst. You know, coming from a military background, um, you always prepare for the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. So... I'm curious, can you guys hear my wife cooking in the background? <laughs> this whole uh, live stream thing is new to me. What do you think about GE? You know, I haven't, I haven't uh, had a chance to really dig into the numbers. I know that they cut the dividend 50% today. Um, I didn't own GE before this. I really haven't looked at GE recently. Um, I'm curious, can somebody type, are you guys seeing my video feed? Are you guys seeing a video of me right now? I'm just looking at the, uh, at the uh, text stream here. Okay, so yes, you guys are seeing it. Thank you. Um, I've seen the video. <laughs> Do I think the oil market's overpriced right now? Um, I would say um, I think the oil market's priced appropriately. It seems to be, uh, you know, doing quite well. I, it's, you know, it's come back a little bit more than I was expecting. I kind of expected it to stay down there for quite a while, but um, it's doing well. I'm pulling up the, the numbers right now on this. Looks like it's sitting at 56. I really kind of see the oil prices remaining pretty flat unless the uh, demand changes significantly. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. You can't hear her cooking. Uh, I, it's really loud here for me, so I'm, I'm definitely hearing her cook. I'm glad you guys aren't hearing it. Um, how much time and what, what do you read per day? So, um, you know, I do most of my reading in the car through audiobooks, to be honest with you. And I would say that um, probably 30 minutes to an hour a day. Um, anytime I get a long trip or I'm flying somewhere, I'll probably knock out a book on. If I go on a, if I go on a long flight, I'll probably knock out an entire book on the flight just listening. Uh, and cash, not how they everybody know. So I like this question. So should you rebalance or sit on cash in a highly overvalued market. So what I would tell you is it real a lot of this comes down to capital gains. So if you're sitting on a lot of capital gains with a certain pick, let's say you purchase company XYZ and you got a lot of capital gains on that, most likely it's going to make more sense to just continue to hold the pick. Because after you pay capital gains and you swap out of it and then you're looking at what's what do I put it in now? Um, you might be better off just riding it out with something like that. If you've purchased something in the last year or two and it's gone nowhere, um, that's probably something maybe you might want to look at offloading or, or putting into something else. You know, we've talked on the podcast. Um, yeah, my legs still are, hurt, are hurting. Um, we talked on the podcast and... Um, oh, I lost my train of thought here. Um We've talked a lot about on the, on the podcast with the uh, returns that we, we we see with some of these companies, like the McKesson one. You know, I think that that looks like a great stock pick, even though the market's sky high. I think that you're still able to buy that. 
you know, if the market would crash in the next year or two, you're probably going to see that go down from where you bought it at. But like I said on the show, just buy some more equity. I mean, that's how you need to look at that is, is just buy some more stocks. Any luck getting Warren Buffett on the show? So we've reached out to Buffett, and he's actually replied. He said, thank you. I appreciate the kind offer, but he didn't want to come on the show. So, uh, yeah, I wish that would have worked out. Yeah, uh, I like that last comment. So we, we saw a lot of this over email about Amazon trying to enter the space with the MCK pick. And... Um, you know, I think that that's a real risk. I think that that's something that you got to be prepared for. And I mean, don't ever underestimate Jeff Bezos. Um, he's an animal. And I think that I think that the amount of revenue that they could take off of McKesson is still kind of up for determination. Um, I would be surprised if they could take more than 15% market share. You know, and if that's the case, you know, revenues pull back. Yeah, I think it's still going to perform pretty well based on the numbers I was seeing when I was doing the intrinsic value on McKesson. So I was, I'm was i comfortable owning it, but some other people might see it a little bit differently. And they might have a better idea of what that risk actually is. You know, I am I might be a little lazy in my analysis as to what I think the, uh, the risks are there with the Amazon thing coming in. Um, Kroger, sorry, don't know anything about Kroger. I'd have to look it up. Um, here, I can do that while we're talking. So let me uh, pull up Kroger. Okay. My battery's about to die, but let's see how that goes. <laughs> okay, so I'm looking at Kroger. Just to kind of walk you through the way I'm looking at it. So I start off looking at the top line, you know. And so whenever I look at that, the revenues look like they're very solid growth. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, when I look at the net income, definitely not much of a, a margin on Kroger. So, you know, they're doing very large numbers here. $115 billion on their top line, but only $1.9 billion on their bottom line. So you're looking at like a 2% margin from the top line to the bottom line, which is, you know, not so awesome. Um, and the reason why that's not awesome is because that's what the company can bank. That's what the company can retain um, after they're done, or after that money's been made, after that profit's been generated. They can either keep that in the corporate accounts or they can pay it off as a dividend. Looks like they're paying a 45, uh, is that, what is that, USD? Yeah, looks like it's a 45 cent dividend. So I would be willing to bet that their book value is pretty flat. Let me see here. Um, yeah, it's growing a little bit. So their what's their payout ratio? Let's see here. Payout ratio is twenty percent. So you know of of the profit that they're making, which you know isn't a big number um, relative to the top line, 20% of it's being paid out to the shareholders. The other 80% is being retained and you're seeing, I mean, this is a great, it's a great company. It's very well managed. I'd have to go in and figure out what I think the intrinsic value is off the, off the cash flows here. But something tells me that this one is probably, uh, this is, uh, way expensive. Uh, let me see. What's the PE on this thing? Let's see here. Sorry, I haven't seen any of the questions. Uh, price to earnings. It's pretty low. Yeah, you know what? I'd have to go in there and look at the... I'd have to do the intrinsic value calc on this. So maybe after I'm done with the video here, I might check it out. But, um, you know, that's kind of the... That's the rough... Uh, rudimentary way that I quickly would look at the company and kind of my thought process of how I'm looking at things and then I'd go in and try to do the intrinsic value on it. Okay. Will Amazon buy Rite Aid for... I don't know. I don't know that one. Um, <laughs> I like this question. Why don't you set up your investment partnership? So to be honest with you, 
that's something I have no interest in doing whatsoever. I just I just want to manage my own money and uh, build my own business and uh, really kind of stay away from the, the partnership thing. I think that I think that's a really really tough thing to do successfully, only because by the time you account for the fees. And by the time you account for outperforming the market, call it 2% or 3% outperformance, and then the fees on top of that, I think that's a real challenge for a person to, uh, to do something like that. And so for me, that sounds like a lot of stress. And that sounds like a lot of, uh, like you don't have control at that point. Like you're you're a victim of all those people that are expecting you to outperform. And let's say you have one year that's bad. Now they're taking all their money away from you. It just sounds like a nightmare to me. But there's other guys out there in the space that, that enjoy it. I just I'd much rather uh, try to create a product or service and a business and go that route. But that's me. Um. Okay. Let's see here. What do I think about the teachings of Dave Ramsey? So, um, you know, I don't, I don't really listen to Dave Ramsey. I, I know what he, uh, I know what he's all about. I mean, he's helping people get out of debt, and um, I think that that's a really important uh, service that he's providing to help people get on track and focus on. Um, producing a positive cash flow in their lives. Um, he, he definitely serves a completely different um, m market segment than what we focus on. Um, our expectation is that, that a person who's listened to our show and a person who's kind of using our content is there because they have some investable cash flow and that they're not in debt. Um, so I, I think he does a great service, but I'm not anyone that's really listened to too much of the stuff he's done. Robert Kiyosaki, I'm not, I mean, I, I've read his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like a long time ago. Um, I think he kind of uh, has an interesting, you know, niche as well as far as helping people create a business or something like that. But, you know, I don't listen to his podcast or anything like that. Do I invest in the Indian stock market? Not right now. Um... I, I'm watching it. I would probably do it straight, just through an ETF, though, if I was doing it. Where do you recommend finding historical data for your intrinsic value? Uh, Morningstar is a great place. We're getting ready to launch a new platform, which will have historical information, uh, longer than 10 years historical information uh, that will help people. But, um, you know, in the past, I've used Morningstar. What's my thoughts on Ray Dalio's new book? I love it. Um, you know, we just released the podcast this past weekend on Saturday. Um, and, you know, the book is just awesome. It's a really awesome book. There's a lot to be learned in there. And uh, you can tell it was a it was a work of passion for him. Yeah, I, sorry. I, I, I talked a little bit about GE, but I didn't give any tips or anything like that. I haven't really dug into the numbers. I just saw in the Wall Street Journal this morning that they had their their big uh, dividend meltdown, 50%. But, all right, guys, I'm about ready to lose battery power on my computer. And instead of s setting up the uh, power cord while everyone's here, I'm just going to uh, wrap things up. But uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, never done anything like this before. Um, Thanks for all the questions, and hopefully some of the stuff I was talking about was useful and uh, helped out. Is there any final questions that are just really urgent? Let me see here. What do you think about Howard Marks? I'm a very big fan. <laughs> I really like his book. When will I be doing this again? You know, I don't know. This was, to be honest with you, this was a test tonight just to kind of see what this was all about. Uh, I was just talking with Stig probably about an hour or 30 minutes ago, and I told him I was going to try to do this, and he just kind of laughed. He goes, oh, okay, let me know how that goes. So this was this is neat. Uh, 
I don't know how often I'll do this, but uh, you know, when we do, maybe we'll blast that out on, on our email list and let people know a lot more time in advance. I kind of just decided to do this at the last minute. So um, maybe we'll do something that's a little bit more organized and we have more people on the, on the call. Um, get Stig on next. Yeah, no, we'll get Stig on. Uh, I think there's a way that we can have a back and forth or something. I don't know. I'll, I'll try to figure it out. To be in <laughs> uh, the TSP fund is that a military guy out there six six Kevin is that you you a military guy yeah I don't I don't know what to tell you on that one I, I'm not a big fan of any of those funds all right guys hey uh, that's all I got thanks so much for joining me and uh, this was fun. Let's see if I can figure out how to turn this thing off. <laughs>